Uh, let me first introduce Ivan Kozarev, who was most recently a postdoctoral research associate and Simons Junior Fellow at Columbia. So he obtained his undergrad degree in physics and applied math at Yale, uh, with actual distinction in both majors and pursued his PhD in AMO physics at Harvard in John Doyle's lab. Throughout his dissertation research, Ivan focused on extending, te extending techniques of laser cooling and trapping molecules with the goal of developing a, a novel experimental platform for quantum science, complex polyatomic molecules in the ultra-cold regime. So Ivan was the first to demonstrate the effects of radiation pressure force on polyatomic radicals and uh, has been able to achieve their direct laser cooling for sub kelvin temperatures. So probing th these species in a quantum regime could aid in uncovering the fundamental scientific mysteries such as the origins of biomolecular homochirality, matter antimatter symmetry in our universe. So, so for PhD work, Ivan was awarded in award outstanding thesis research in AMO physics by the APS. So during his postdoctoral uh, he was the great ultra cold gaze, uh, molecular gases by laser cooling and precision precise dissociation of molecules. And so the aim was to develop one specific control of laser cooled molecules in an attempt to uh, well break records temperature and also to study ultra cold control chemistry. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Paul. Perfect. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Timur, for the introduction. Uh, let me start my slides. Share screen. OK. Get that started. OK. Uh, can you see my slides? Yep. Perfect. OK. I'm going to hide everybody. Okay. Excellent. OK. So um, uh, first uh, disclaimer, so I, I've recently uh, moved to Chicago to kind of switch fields a bit to become a quantitative uh, researcher uh, in a financial company. So uh, the slide might, might give away a bit, uh, but um, uh, if, if you joined because you were hoping I will be talking about ATMs or cash or anything financially related, I'm going to disappoint you. Um, if the title, if you didn't read the abstract and uh, the title makes no sense, then you probably have this picture in mind, but I think the closer um, visual description of what I'm going to be talking about is actually about uh, modern methods of uh, molecular physics and especially how to extend uh, the use of uh, laser radiation and laser cooling to control molecules uh, that have high degree of asymmetry. And so one of the ways to think about the development of the field of uh, atomic molecular and optical physics uh, in recent years is that it's moving toward more complexity, all right? So um, uh, experiments with ultra-cold atoms uh, can assemble this uh, remarkable uh, structures uh, from individual um, particles. And then uh, in recent years also, there has been a remarkable uh, development in the past 10 years on the control of diatomic molecules and uh, recently dual group um, has demonstrated that they can load uh, individual molecules in optical tweezers uh, using uh, laser, uh, using a laser light, uh, laser light, and methods uh, from atomic physics. And then also there has been uh, some um, development in the ways to bring polyatomic molecules to ultra cold temperatures. Specifically, pioneering work by um, as a group at uh, Max Planck, uh, where they've uh, demonstrated production of ultra cold, uh, uh, ultra cold uh, polyatomic molecules in 2012. And so another way how I would like to think about it is actually the field has been moving toward more asymmetry. So in this case where, um, you know, complexity in a sense uh, leads, uh, leads to more asymmetry. So uh, the way um, I, I understand it is, you know, you go from atoms to diatomic or linear molecules, you break the spherical symmetry. But then uh, the next transition that happened recently is uh, there, uh, the movement from linear molecules uh, to uh, symmetric top molecules, um, like indicated here. And actually there has been a, an exciting recent result uh, from the group of um, John Doyle, where they've extended laser cooling uh, to symmetric top molecules. And so the focus of my talk today will be on trying uh, to understand whether um, laser cooling is possible, and laser cooling and optical cycling is possible for molecules with uh, no symmetries, uh, so asymmetric molecules. And this is our recent work um, 
that just appeared in PRX. So um, in addition to just fundamental interest in why um, asymmetric uh, top, uh, why extending uh, more degrees of control to asymmetric top molecules is interesting, there are also a large number of possible applications on, uh, okay, so, uh, there are also a large number of possible applications in uh, traditional fields of physics. So obviously by moving to new structures and new constituents, uh, there is a possibility for uh, studying interesting and novel chemical reactions in the new regime. Uh, additionally, the uh, new uh, molecular uh, orientation and configurations uh, can have applications in quantum simulation and quantum computing. So specifically, um, I would like to draw your attention to this recent paper in PRX by Albert Koch and Preskill, where they describe how, what is, how you can use um, asymmetric top molecules to robustly encode qubits. Uh, finally, uh, you know, uh, finally such structures as internal rotors and uh, chiral structures, um, which are, uh, you know, left and right mirror images uh, of, of each other, that have a lot of interest for um, now biology and chemistry can only appear in asymmetric top molecules. So there is no configuration in uh, higher symmetry um, structures that lead to those. And those structures can be used to study various um, uh, various uh, interesting uh, fundamental physics uh, properties. Okay, so let's see. Uh -huh. here we go. So uh, my talk today will be mainly divided into four different parts. So I'll start by talking about the idea of an optical cycling center, which allows you to kind of conceptually combine um, various, uh, various molecules that are amenable to uh, laser-based control. Uh, instead of thinking them as kind of disparate uh, ad hoc um, you know, cases. So then I will describe our work on trying to understand whether asymmetric top molecules um, that have previously been not significantly considered uh, as uh, amenable to laser cooling, whether they can ha have productive optical cycling centers. Uh, then uh, I will uh, briefly mention about vibronic coupling where it can lead to uh, symmetry breakdown, even in uh, molecules that are linear or symmetric tops. So that further complicates the process of optical cycling centers. Uh, the, the process of achieving optical uh, cycling in molecules with high degrees of symmetry. And finally, uh, after talking about the challenges of uh, laser cooling in complex molecules, I will describe a possible solution, this idea of super molasses uh, that uh, we have recently uh, cited and uh, posted on archive. So let's start with the optical cycling center. Before I uh, go into why laser cooling doesn't work or it's hard to achieve in uh, molecules in general and polyatomic asymmetric molecules in particular, I wanna take a step back and kind of understand when laser cooling does work and uh, why does it work in atoms? So in my mind, there are three important steps for uh, optical cycling, which is a prerequisite to laser cooling. So repeated scattering of photons to work. So photon absorption, spontaneous emission and return to the initial state. So I deliberately divided into the three parts and then you know there is uh, during the cycle that you get an H uh, over lambda momentum kick. I deliberately divide into three parts because each of those three parts can and sometimes does break down in, um, in molecules and specifically in more complex molecules. So let's try to look in detail. So atoms are often thought in physics as two level systems. And so you can apply laser radiation to repeatedly uh, transfer the population between these two systems. For molecules, even for simple diatomic molecules, uh, there are many levels involved. And so um, for each electronic state indicated here by um, blue and green molecular potentials, there are many vibrational levels. And there are additionally for vibrations, there are many uh, rotation levels that I have not shown here. So okay, let's say you're lucky enough to find a molecule that uh, will interact with laser radiation. So you excite it uh, to the excited electronic state. Where first, they might not be spontaneous emission, so it might just break apart into two separate atoms. Or even if it does emit photons spontaneously, they return to a large number of internal vibrational states or internal rotation states. So uh, it it's, cannot be taken a priori that you can actually re achieve repeated optical cycling in molecules. And perhaps it's actually counterintuitive that you can. The situation in polyatomic molecules, so molecules that have three or more uh, atoms, 
is even more complicated. So here on the right-hand side, you can see actually uh, calculated potential energy surf, uh, surfaces by uh, Svetlana Karachikov and collaborators for uh, strontium monohydroxide. Um, and you can see there are additional degrees of, of freedom. Now the surfaces are multidimensional, so the losses, there are even greater uh, possibilities for losses. So what we would like to have is a situation like represented on the left-hand side here. So first, this is a um, uh, kind of the idea that Jarosa proposed where, you know, it's impossible to find a truly two-level system in molecular structure. So the best we can hope for is that it's quasi two-level system where upon electronic excitation, it mostly decays back to the same state it started with. And then uh, the population of higher um, internal states like vibration rotation is significantly decreased. So uh, in 2015, we actually uh, found one such molecule, so strontium monohydroxide, um, shown here. And we've measured its uh, uh, Franconian factors, which indicates the degree of overlap of uh, different vibrational uh, levels in the ground and excited state. And it did indicate that, you know, uh, A, that um, upon electronic excitation, it primarily returns to the same uh, internal state it started with. But then with three lasers, you should be able to scatter between a few hundred to thousand points. And additionally, uh, this transition is in a very convenient uh, wavelength band where you just need um, solid state external cavity diode lasers. Um, the next question that came is, okay, is this RH kind of uh, one-off molecules that just happens to have this nice property? Or uh, is there something about a SRH structure that um, can be extended to different species or more complex species? So that's where this idea of an optical cyclone center comes in. Um, so here I'm, I'm showing um, electron uh, configuration uh, for uh, the valence electron on the, on the strontium atom. So what happens is the strontium has uh, two valence electrons. And then during the chemical bond with the OH group, one of those electrons gets uh, moved over. And so essentially, you have a single valence electron residing on the strontium plus ion. And then um, this is the electron that actually interacts with laser light. And so, as you can see, X is the ground state, A is the excited electronic state. And then while uh, the shapes of uh, electron configuration slightly um, are different, that they do not overlap with the rest of the molecule. So essentially, uh, what the electron sees that is optically active is only the strontium uh, core. So this is what enables uh, repeated cycling of photons in the system. B state actually has a better uh, overlapped with the um, ground electronic state, as you can see here. So the frank condom factors are more diagonal. So you can scatter more photons uh, with a single laser. So this idea of an optical cycling center is, is uh, pretty powerful, where uh, as we started um, looking into more molecules, turns out there is a quite a large class of molecules that's um, alkaline earth monoalkoxide free radicals, where it's a max metal bonded to oxygen bonded to uh, Elegant, uh, this MR, uh, MR type molecules, where they should, in theory, also have very similar um, optical cycling properties. And so you can think kind of as attaching this optical cycling center, strontium or its um, close cousin calcium to oxygen bonded to a much bigger ligand, and then hope that it actually does not perturb the optical cycling properties. Uh, it seems like an interesting idea in theory. Uh, of course, the big question does it actually work like that? So uh, what we uh, what we then the way to confirm it we started looking at two closely related uh, related molecules. So one is uh, calcium IH, which is a close analog of uh, strontium IH that we've uh, previously worked with. And so the measurements that we did is uh, uh, detailed in this paper from last year. Uh, we excited um, a supersonic beam of uh, calcium IH with a single laser and then watched what are the emission wavelengths. On the right hand side, you can see the emission spectrum, so dispersed laser induced fluorescence. So the strong peak uh, around 625 uh, nanometers is actually indicates that upon electronic excitation, most of the molecules decay back to the same uh, state they started with. So we excited 626 and it comes back to it mid 626, so it comes back to the same state. There is a small bump at around 655 nanometers that corresponds to calcium O vibrational stretch. The grayed out area is uh, just a contamination from a metastable calcium uh, being present in the supersonics. So essentially, it, it behaves like we expect. The emission is uh, highly diagonal, and there is only a single vibrational bond uh, that becomes active. So then, then we uh, tuned our laser to excite uh, uh, calcium monomethoxide, so calcium CH3. So there are two interesting um, 
observations here. So one is that you can see that the rad peak around 6, uh, 26 nanometer is only shifted slightly by a few nanometers uh, to the right hand side. So that indicates that actually the um, optical activity is very slightly, uh, slightly perturbed by the CH3 ligand which is kind of remarkable because, you know, it's a big chunk you're attaching to the rest of the molecule, but electrons that interact with the laser essentially doesn't care about that. Additionally, you can also see that um, there is only one um, optically active vibrational mode, which is calcium O stretch, which is slightly more intense than in the uh, triatomic counterpart. And then I also marked this really tiny bump around 680 nanometers that corresponds to OC stretch, which if I didn't mark it, you would not have seen it, uh, but I'm an honest person, so there is one additional uh, decay there. So there is additional complexity uh, introduced there. But, uh, so, uh, you know, our uh, theory has actually, and I guess initial experimental observations have been uh, uh, recently confirmed uh, by the Dula group in this uh, very exciting result um, led by uh, Debian and Nathaniel, uh, where they've demonstrated uh, transverse laser cooling of the calcium OCH3. Uh, which is represented in warm colors in the, on the right hand side uh, in the bottom. And then on the left-hand side, you can compare to our results from 2017, laser, transverse laser cooling calcium, oh, strontium OH um, molecular beam. And so you can see that uh, in both cases, uh, the degree of cooling is uh, remarkably comparable. And you can see both heating and cooling, uh, which indicates that we can uh, change between the two by tuning the detuning of, our, of the lasers. And also the final temperature corresponds to around a millikelvin in both cases, uh, maybe maybe slightly less. So then it, 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 the interesting uh, fact is that, you know, despite this additional increase, increased complexity, you, the tools that we were able to uh, use with laser cooling and linear triatomic molecules essentially transfer over to um, symmetric depth molecules. So the next uh, question that we had is, okay, so that's possible to laser cool uh, in a two optical cycle in, in highly symmetric molecules. Uh, what about molecules that lose symmetry? And so this work uh, was actually a collaboration funded by the Keck Foundation between the uh, Solovinsky lab, uh, where I was doing my postdoc, and uh, John Doyle's group at Harvard, and uh, led uh, in large part by Ben Augenbaum, who is a grad student um, in John Doyle's lab. Right, so uh, the question we had, as we've seen, right, since the uh, replacement of the R ligand um, is a more complex one, only slightly perturbs uh, the electron cloud distribution. So what if you try to kind of engineer a molecule of interest by replacing different parts? So here we kind of show how our thinking evolved. And on the right-hand side, you have a chiral molecule. So a chiral molecules, as I said, are very interesting for a large number of biochemical applications, kind of answering even fundamental uh, symmetry violating uh, properties of nature. So it would be interesting to have a really precisely controlled chiral molecule where you can do uh, spectroscopy accurately. So is it possible to do so? Before we go into chiral molecules, we actually took incremental steps. And so here you can see, um, so on the horizontal axis going to the right, you see where we've calculated the electron cloud distribution, so electronic orbitals for uh, linear molecule calcium OH, which we knew you could achieve photon cycling for, um, calcium, uh, as, uh, calcium methoxy, which is a symmetric top molecule, planar molecule, and then uh, asymmetric top molecule, uh, cash, calcium um, sulfur hy hydroxide. Um, yeah, uh, cal uh, calcium OH, yes. Um, and so, at the, uh, and then on the vertical axis, as you go down, uh, this is the higher energy state. So X is the ground state, A is the first, sec uh, A is the first, B second, C is third excited state. So specifically, I would like to draw attention that, uh, to the fact that within uh, X, A, and B excited state, so no matter what the symmetry of the molecule is, the electron uh, wave function for this optical cyclone center, in this case, calcium, looks essentially identical. So that's really optimistic for us to achieve uh, potentially laser cooling of these molecules. Uh, and in fact, Do uh, Dual Group has actually demonstrated uh, uh, in collaboration with Tim Stein, Tim Stein and this group that it is possible to, uh, that uh, the emission spectrum lo looks highly similar to uh, molecules with high degrees of symmetry. And so it should be possible to achieve laser cooling. So here you can see the data for one line for um, taken by Ben Augenbrown for uh, calcium SH molecule. And you can see that again, 
it's highly diagonal and there is a slight degree of omission to calcium SH band and stretch. The band appears because the molecule is um, now asymmetric. In fact, we've analyzed uh, the vibrational brain generators for over 20 species. All of these molecules have been produced in the experiment and our observations indicate that uh, remarkably, uh, scattering more than 100 of photons should be possible with uh, three lasers. For molecules of uh, high, uh, with various constitu constituents with various structures. So some of the highlights, for example, uh, is it should be possible to for strontium and H2, which you can benchmark against the experiments that were uh, uh, experimental results that were available at the time. We should be able to scatter around 10,000 photons with four lasers, and that's comparable with uh, diatomic molecules uh, with only one smaller laser. And then even such complex molecule um, as calcium methyl cyclopentadienyl indicated here should be able to scatter around 100 to 1,000 photons with just uh, a few lasers, and that should be enough for subdoppler form. Uh, of the beam. Initially, you can think that, you know, maybe our results are too optimistic, but surprisingly to us, there is actually experimental data on dispersed laser induced fluorescence for this uh, ring bound molecule. And so you can see on the left hand side uh, where uh, the emission spectrum for um, uh, calcium cyclopentadienyl uh, shows essentially only progression. So uh, to the calcium, as, uh, calcium CP vibration. And on the bottom, you can see that uh, for the cal uh, calcium muscle cyclo uh, calcium muscle cyclopentadienyl, the emission spectrum is again highly diagonal. There are no uh, multiple vibrational peaks. Uh, so, and the experimental measurements turn out to be either in agreement or even slightly uh, better than what we have calculated. I would like to also draw your attention to recent related work by the USC and UCLA teams on similar uh, optical cyclone centers bound to uh, uh, rings. To carbon rings. So uh, the next transition is I would like to talk about the breakdown of symmetry due to vibronic couplings. And here I would like uh, to acknowledge uh, our collaboration with Professor uh, Tim Steinle, where I did this uh, spectroscopy and who has actually led uh, the accurate studies of, um, uh, of many uh, molecules, uh, chemical studies of uh, in detail spectroscopy of molecules that physicists are interested in. So. Um, Let's come back to uh, the, our work on calcium OCH3. And uh, usually I kind of uh, show the slides that are previously shown is like, okay, it, it's very similar to calcium IH, uh, uh, optical cyclone center, centers uh, rules, so end of story. Uh, here I would like to go in a bit more detail. So you can actually see that if you excite to the B state of calcium OCH3, there's rather this interesting uh, additional lines. So on one hand, you can see that there is a uh, calcium OC band uh, appearing. And then there is additional mystery feature, both of those indicated in the red. So uh, for a long while, we couldn't figure out what the uh, emission feature, uh, what this uh, mystery feature is. So it turns out that um, when you excite to the B state in um, calcium OCH3, there is a very, uh, there is an accidental degeneracy with this uh, state, 111 state, that has one unit of calcium OC stretch, one unit of calcium OC band, uh, calcium OC band and one unit of OC stretch. And so because of this mixing, um, uh, because of vibronic coupling, you actually end up with this additional decays that are shown in red here. So even, the molecule, even though the molecule is highly symmetric, there is a breakdown in symmetry due to vibronic coupling. And actually, Doyle Group has done uh, detailed studies, and uh, yeah, so I'm just going to flash the slides that I borrowed from Ben, detailed studies of uh, breakdown of symmetries in various molecules and indicated that essentially generically, there are this vibronic coupling additional losses that tend to the three, minus three level. At, um, afterwards, you can explain them by accurately calculating those, but a priori it's kind of hard to predict what the, this additional uh, vibronic induced losses will be. So they have also, um, so Louis Baum um, has recently defended his thesis in Harvard where he laid out the framework for um, achieving laser cooling and trapping uh, in a full 3D magnet optical trap of calcium OH. And for calcium OH, it turns out you actually, because of this additional vibronic mixings uh, that break down the symmetry, you need between six and eight rebumping lasers, as indicated here. So while that is possible to achieve, it is definitely technically challenging. So that brings me to the last uh, part of my talk, where uh, we actually have an idea for what, what is a possible way forward, where you know uh, there is this generic vibronic breakdowns of symmetries and then to the minus three level, and how can you avoid uh, how, what methods you can use without going to you know ten lasers. 
Uh, and here I, I will describe the work that was led uh, largely by Conrad Vance, uh, who is about to defend his thesis uh, in the Zelovinsky lab at Columbia. So the general idea for a laser slowing is you have a counterpart creatine laser beam, and you know you need to emit around 10 to the 4 photons for lighter species like calcium H, or even more for heavier species. And then you can hope to capture in the best case scenario a very small fraction of your molecular beam. So on the right-hand side, I have a velocity distribution of SRH uh, cryogenic molecular buffer gas beam. And you can see there is a tiny fraction of molecules that will be captured in a mod because the capture velocity of a molecular mod is very small. So we, the way we started thinking about this project, okay, so we would like to have some sort of field configuration where we can capture most of this uh, molecules coming from a beam, like as indicated here. So that's our objective, what this configuration should be. Let's take a step back. So the usual uh, kind of a thing, uh, explanation uh, to non-experts is like laser cooling is equivalent to you know slowing a, slowing a ball involved with a ping pong ball, right? That's that's really hard. That's why it takes a lot of photons, uh, and especially this true as you go to heavier and heavier polyatomic molecules, right? So you, it becomes even heavier. Smart idea, you know, you need more oomph in your slowing method. This is where this idea, uh, the idea of a coherent bichromatic force comes in. And this is not a new idea. This is an idea that was around for like more than 30 years initially, uh, studied in the former Soviet Union, including Ukraine, where, where I'm from initially. And um, so there is an excellent review, by the way, uh, from 2017 um, uh, by uh, Hal Metka. And so the idea was around for a while, but uh, the realization uh, that it can be implemented in molecule is really recent. So here uh, in 2018, we demonstrated that it should be possible uh, to push uh, the cryogenic beam of SRH um, using this um, coherent bichromatic force. And concurrently, the group at UConn demonstrated that it's possible as calcium chloride. So the, thing, the, uh, the use for molecules experimental is, is really recent. And so the idea is that you use um, coherent forces now and to avoid stimulated emission. So let's, let's see in detail um, why, why it has more promise for complex molecules. And so, uh, okay, so uh, let's, if, if I'm running out of time, by the way, feel free to interrupt, but uh, I have a couple more slides. So uh, first um, in- You have one um, minute, Ivan. One minute, perfect. Yeah. Okay, so yeah. then, then, then I'll wrap up, right. So then the idea is that right now in the cycles there is is because we're using uh, spontaneous stimulated emission now, we are not relying on emission of photons. So the, this technique can be applied to a much larger um, number of molecules that either break apart when we, they absorb a photon or uh, do not decay to the same state. So uh, the, uh, the underlying structures that we're using is actually two radiatively coupled two level systems. And we've demonstrated, I refer you to our, app, uh, to our um, I recently posted paper on archive, and we've actually demonstrated that if we can achieve forces that are molasses like cooling forces that are orders of magnitude larger in capture velocity and in magnitudes, as I demonstrated here. And so we've demonstrated that it compresses phase space and confirms the capture velocities. Um, and so finally, I would like uh, to highlight some of the exciting current and future directions uh, that are going on in the field and uh, thank uh, my collaborators. Uh, specifically the Simons Foundation for finding my postdoctoral work and CAC Foundation for finding the collaboration on asymmetric top molecules between Harvard and Columbia. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ivan, uh, for the excellent uh, and exciting talk. So we have quite a few questions, so I hope we'll be able to ask them. So answers should come really quickly. So yeah. what are the interests so uh, Arian uh, Jed Babaye is asking, what's the interest really broaders in polyatomic molecules? So interests uh, where? Like the fundamental interest? Or related to, yeah, internal rotors. Oh, yeah. Yes, uh, so internal rotors, there is actually, um, I think there is, uh, there is a work, one second, let me go back to this slide. Um, there is actually uh, work uh, by, I think, this collaboration where uh, there, there are some proposals where internal rotors uh, can be used uh, for, um, I think, testing some of the uh, constant uh, variations because they are, they are lead to like uh, new degeneracies in uh, uh, internal structures and then they can be uh, dependent different ways on uh, fundamental constants. Uh, 
uh, yeah, that, that's, that's my understanding. But uh, my general answer is like the new structures in uh, molecules generically lead to new interesting observations. Like for example, I'm, I'm gonna just highlight okay. our, our work. So we have this proposal on kind of using uh, uh, bending modes in SRH to search for ultralight uh, dark matter uh, through microwave spectroscopy. And again, it arises, this enhancement in SRH arises because of this new uh, degrees of freedom uh, that are rising in uh, complex molecules. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so we have a lot of questions. There's no way we can ask all of them. Mm -hmm. So we, I'm just, just going to try uh, for a few ones. Look, for Bill Phillips is asking laser cooling of the symmetric top as transverse cooling looked great, but transverse cooling is much less demanding in terms of number of photons, ne of no photons needed than optical molasses or a mod. Is this going to work for those things? Can you give rules for th of thumb for when things are going to satisfy the requirements for good cooling? Yeah, I, I think that's that's an excellent question, and I I would say the answer to that is it, it's it's unanswered yet. So, and uh, the reason for it one is that I would, so first right transfer cooling look great, and actually transfer cooling does uh, can lead to a lot of interesting applications, like for example for beam precision measurement or you know uh, combining uh, transfer cooling to actually load some other sort of trap that does not use uh, modern molasses. Uh, and then uh, the second answer is that's where potentially a uh, combination of this coherent simulated forces together with radiative forces could be very useful, right? So if you can combine transfer cooling and then load the uh, super molasses um, trap that we have um, explored. So that, that can be beneficial. So I think, I think this is still in progress and it remains to be seen. Yeah, not obvious all right, at all. So you're right. So two more questions before we move on to the next speaker. Vasily Makalov is asking, naively, it seems that an emission of a photon can cause rotations of such molecules. Does it impose restrictions and limits for such cooling? Yeah, I, I think that that's actually right. So I, I completely swept under the rug, the rotations, uh, rotational degrees of freedom. And that's, that's actually a uh, challenge. And, and again, uh, an interesting question. We addressed it in detail in our paper, so I refer to our paper. But we do think that uh, for molecules, uh, so for molecules with uh, symmet uh, symmetric top, we see three symmetry. We have demonstrated that we can control rotations precisely in such a way that uh, they do not lead to additional uh, losses. And that has been experimentally confirmed uh, by uh, Debye and Nathaniel and collaborators in the Doyle group. And then for asymmetric top molecules, we have spent a lot of time, Ben and I, looking into the um, uh, rotational degrees of freedom, and we think that they, again, they could be controlled. Experimentally, that remains to be verified. Okay, sounds good. So last question for, for Yvonne for today. Uh, Dima Woodker is asking, is in your discussion of the super cooling, could you explain what the two radiatively coupled systems you refer to are? Right, yes, that, that's a really good question, actually. Um, again, sorry, I, I didn't have much time to go into details on that, so I have, I have it in the additional slide. Um, so, for example, um, here uh, you can see this is, uh, we, we, we were inspired by looking at barium hydride because barium hydride, even though we succeeded in uh, laser cooling uh, the barium hydride molecular beam in the Lewinsky lab, it was really challenging. And so we started looking at barium hydride and other methods to cool it. And so it turns out that uh, one way in barium hydride, for example, you can uh, break it apart into two radiative the coupled level system is shown here on the right hand side. So you can consider this J1 half spin rotation levels and then J3 half spin rotation levels coupled to different excited electronic states. And so this is, uh, for example, um, one radiative the coupled system, and then this is another radiative the coupled system. And so if you tune uh, the intensities properly, so one is talking to X to A, the other is talking to X to B. And if you tune the intensities properly, which again, we have confirmed um, uh, computationally in, in our paper on super molasses, it actually works out to create molasses-like cooling forces uh, in um, barium hydride. And again, this is a generic property of uh, molecular. While the large spin rotation splitting is specific to barium hydride, uh, find is this radiatively coupled to level system is generic to uh, molecules and polyatomic molecules. And I, again, I refer you to, the, to our paper. Sorry, I'm running out of time. Yeah. So thank you very much for questions. And uh, so whoever is interested can ask them uh, during the post discussion, post seminar discussion speaker. Links will be provided in the chat uh, after mm -hmm. this meeting. So thanks. Let's thank you once more. And uh, let's move on to the next speaker in this uh, header feature to, you know, having today. And who is um, Matteo Ippel? 
they also um, he uh, he got his PhD from the University of Pisa, Italy, I believe, and uh, as well as undergraduate degree or PhD from Princeton and undergrad from the University of Pisa. And his research focuses on theoretical condensed matter physics uh, topics uh, such as non-equilibrium quantum dynamics and topological quantum matter and quantum information. So his recent um, one of his most recent and impressive research results include the demonstration of a long-lived prethermalized state in, um, in out of equilibrium Bose Hubbard model and a proposal for quantum programming of a discrete time crystal. So here, maybe very late. Okay. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, good. Um, good, so, okay, it's a great pleasure to be speaking at the virtual AMO seminar. Um, I hope I'm not gonna disappoint you because I'm not going to speak about real atoms and molecules, but other artificial ones, but I hope that you'll still find that interesting. Um, so this is work that I've done in collaboration with Kostya Kechedze from Google, uh, Roderick Mosner from Dresden, uh, Shivaji Sondi at Princeton and my advisor Vedika Kemani here at Stanford. Uh, and this is the archive uh, post. Good, so the uh, premise of this work is that uh, we are entering the so-called NISC era. Uh, NISC stands for noisy intermediate scale quantum devices. And these are uh, platforms with a number of qubits ranging from a few tens to a few hundreds and gate fidelity is in the neighborhood of 99%. So error rates around, around 1%. And these are impressive requirements, but still quite far from those demanded of fault tolerant quantum computing, which on this graph of qubits and error rate would be somewhere down towards uh, the bottom right, with still some ways to go. Uh, however, these devices that we have are already uh, starting to get us into this new and exciting era for quantum simulation. And um, if you remember 2019, which feels like a million years ago, uh, one of the big scientific events of, of, of last year was this uh, announcement by the Google Quantum Group of quantum computational supremacy, which means a computational task, which in this case was the simulation of the output of a random quantum circuit, which you could perform in uh, polynomial time, so efficiently in the size of the problem on their quantum device, uh, as opposed to classical computers where you could, uh, where you would have to overcome an exponential barrier to, to solve the same problem. And this was achieved on their device which is called a Sycamore chip that has 53 uh, transmon qubits and 84 uh, couplers arranged in this two-dimensional grid, uh, which was an amazing feat of engineering and, um, and uh, yeah, led to that, that milestone. Uh, now, from the standpoint, this is all, you know, mostly from the standpoint of computer science, but as many body quantum physicists, you can also, um, you can view this from a few different ways. So these devices uh, have a dual nature, which is both, uh, you know, they're both computers in some sense and, and a genuine quantum system in some other sense. So as a computer, you would want to know what kind of questions can it answer that other computers like classical computers can't. Uh, however, as a many body quantum system, you might want to ask what kind of phases can I engineer on it uh, that I can't or, or not as easily uh, or crisply realize on other systems that exist. So in this talk, I'm gonna take the second perspective and think of these devices and particularly Google Sycamore chip as a genuine uh, many body quantum system, just a, an array of, of two level systems, which you can think of as artificial atoms with very tunable couplings and incredible measurement capabilities. Um, and um, as an example, I'll use the discrete time crystal as a new quantum many body phase um, that you could uh, crisply display on this type of systems. And uh, uh, you, know, you, can't, you can't get or not as easily on other existing platforms. So to motivate why I'm going to look at the discrete time crystal, um, which is a non-equilibrium phase of matter, uh, I'm going to uh, you know, uh, think a little bit about the typical way uh, of condensed matter theory of looking at, at problems. Uh, and I'm gonna be broadly generalizing, but uh, typically you think about static Hamiltonians and you try to probe their low temperature, long wavelength properties. Um, and the kinds of measurements that you, could, that you can perform in experiment and explain theory are broadly coarse grained, such as uh, perhaps you know transport across a mesoscopic sample. You've got uh, very large numbers of constituents, ten to the twenty-three, and and uh, and you're get, getting some some one number that describes their state. Uh, however, 
for this type of um, digital quantum simulators, the uh, type of thing that is most natural is not looking at a static Hamiltonian, but rather at a quantum circuit, which implements an out of equilibrium dynamics. Um, and also energy conservation is not built in. These are systems that are very strongly um, driven and manipulated. And so uh, naturally you're going to be looking at high temperature dynamics. Um, and the kinds of measurements you can do, rather than there being these uh, broad and coarse grained measurements, are extremely fine grained individual qubit readouts. Now, I want to emphasize that these are generally universal devices, so you could actually, in principle, uh, use them to simulate whatever you want, including you know, the Hamiltonian for the Hubbard model or your favorite condensed matter problem. Uh, however, as a matter of, of, of practice, you know, for in, in the near term, it makes sense to try to tailor your questions to the capabilities of the device and what's easiest and most natural uh, for, 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 for its capabilities. Okay, so that said, uh, I'm going to introduce the Floquet discrete time crystal, um, which is a, as I was saying, a non-equilibrium phase of matter. So you have a Hamiltonian, which is driven and it's time dependent with a, a time dependence, which is periodic with period, some period capital T. Um, and in this, in such a phase, your observables will display a period double response for infinitely long times. So even though you're driving them at period T, you would get a response that's periodic with period, say, 2T or some other multiple of T which means that there is a spontaneous breaking of the underlying discrete time translation symmetry. And you can also, you can describe that as a sharp subharmonic response, which is a very unusual thing. Now it's crucial to emphasize that this has to be a genuine phase and not some fine tuned protocol. And so it has to be uh, robust to arbitrary perturbations as long as these are sufficiently weak. So it has to occupy some finite volume in some, in some parameter space. And also that this has to occur in a thermodynamically large many body interacting system. Because in, in small systems, few body systems, uh, then these kind of recurrences and oscillations in time are, are ubiquitous. They're very common and they don't signal this type of uh, spontaneous symmetry breaking. Um, so yeah, this is a sketch where you have your driving protocol with, which implements this uh, discrete time trans translation symmetry and your observable that you might measure displays some different period. So the first obstacle towards uh, realizing um, that kind of phenomenon is avoiding thermalization. Uh, because if you thermalize, then your state achieves thermal equilibrium and none of this interesting non-equilibrium physics is going to be visible. So there are generally, there's only, only one way really to avoid thermalization uh, in the long time limit. And that's known as many body localization. Um, so first of all, let's see why do driven systems uh, absorb energy and heat to infinite temperature? Well, a drive, uh, you know, has a frequency and it carries, as we know from, from, from studying you know, basic quantum mechanics, it, it carries uh, discrete energy packets uh, of H bar omega that the many body system can then absorb and it can increment its energy density uh, you know, indefinitely in time and eventually heat up to infinite temperature. And when that happens, you've lost all the interesting physics. So many body localization instead is a setup in which having sufficiently strong disorder or detuning in your system simply prevents it from absorbing energy indefinitely. And so your system is just never going to achieve thermal equilibrium, even if you run it for arbitrarily long times. Um, there is an alternative approach, which is a little less ambitious, but um, somehow affords you some more flexibility. And that's known as pre-thermalization. Uh, in this case, you are accepting the fact that your system is eventually going to become thermal and achieve uh, you know, infinite temperature thermal equilibrium but you're trying to postpone this inevitable uh, heat death for as long as you can by engineering some extremely long time scale over which you could observe uh, non-equilibrium uh, physics. Uh, and the, there's several different ways of doing this, but the canonical one is to take a drive with very high frequency, high compared to the local energy scales of your problem, uh, which I'm gonna call J. Uh, and if that's the case, then the energy from the drive comes in very, very large, very impractical quanta that your system can't absorb unless it performs some very, very complicated sequence of, of local rearrangements on, on some large subsystem. And that turns out to make to slow down thermalization in an exponential way. So the thermalization time scales exponentially in your drive frequency divided by this local energy scale. And I want to uh, highlight this very exciting collaboration I was a part of uh, with the Mounted Blocks group in which um, bosonic atoms in an optical lattice uh, that was being modulated at some frequency displayed this striking dependence of their uh, thermalization time as a function of frequency 
where by just implementing the lower frequency by a modest amount, like a factor of two or three, you can really buy several orders of magnitude in uh, the lifetime of your experiment before it eventually achieves uh, high temperature. Okay, uh, so now I'm going to, I'm going to introduce uh, what is known as more or less the standard model of a discrete time crystal. Uh, so a simple sort of model that illustrates all the uh, key features. And that's this kicked Ising chain. So it's a, it's a one dimensional spin chain that evolves under a time dependent Hamiltonian that has two, uh, takes on two different values. So for the first part of the drive, it's this Ising Hamiltonian uh, with, with Ising couplings J, coupling uh, the Z component of spins at uh, neighboring locations. And for the second part of the drive, it's this uh, so-called kick where you know, you're flipping your spins about the x-axis by some angle 2G. And then uh, these two uh, steps are simply iterated in time. So if you're evolving an initial state of over n periods, you just iterate the application of these unitary n times. And at this level, this is a free fermion um, time evolution, which you can then solve completely and characterize in great detail. And it has this very interesting phase diagram that I don't have time to get into, but um, there's several interesting phases. But the one we care about is this blue uh, wedge here. That's the uh, pi spin glass or discrete time crystal. And to illustrate the physics there, I'm going to select a special point, a special line rather, uh, which is where your uh, the strength of your of your kick G implements a perfect pi poles. So if that's the case, then uh, you know if you start out from some configuration of spins in the Z basis, after one period you're going to completely flip it um, and go from you know every spin up becomes spin down and vice versa, so that after two periods you revert back to the initial state, and um, Basically, uh, because of the Ising interactions, you're going to have this glassy uh, pattern of spatial order where spins are pointing at random up or down and they're frozen in place. And because of the kick, you're going to um, sequentially invert the direction of all spins and go back to their initial direction. So this uh, is a simple snapshot of what is called spatial temporal long range order, which is this, this uh, sort of combined presence of this glassy spatial order and temporal period doubling. Now, as stated here, this is pretty this is pretty naive. I mean, it's just you've engineered a very fine-tuned protocol, and you're getting, of course, uh, you know, this period double response kind of by hand. But the really remarkable thing and the really deep insight here is that this is robust to arbitrary, sufficiently weak perturbations. So even if you detune your kick from the perfect pi poles, uh, the response is not going to move to you know pi plus or minus epsilon, but it's going to be pinned at pi for an extended range in in these parameters. Okay, now I'm going to very quickly, uh, you know, review uh, past experiments that have been done on this, and I'm not not going to have time to do them justice. They were very complicated experiments on a different array of, of platforms, uh, going from nitrogen vacancy centers in diamond, um, optically trapped uh, ions in one dimension, and um, an ordered uh, crystal investigated through nuclear magnetic resonance. Um, and in all of these different platforms, uh, the experimentalists were able to implement uh, similar types of drives consisting of you know, a, a segment of the evolution where you're evolving with this dominant Ising interaction followed by this imperfect rotation, just like in the toy model that I just flashed. And remarkably, in all of these very different setups, they were able to measure a magnetization signal that explains these pure double oscillations from basically plus or minus one uh, obviously modulated by some decay that's coming in from noise and decoherence, but uh, nonetheless, it's very remarkable uh, cross-platform result. So upon closer uh, theoretical examination, it turns out that all of these experiments in remarkably different ways are realizing pre-thermal versions of the time crystal. And uh, in particular, some of these, such as the this U1 time crystal in the NMR solid, wasn't even known as a mechanism for pre-thermalization before, before the experiment. So, so these have really pushed our understanding of, of pre-thermal phases of matter uh, quite a bit. Really, they have explored uh, different areas that, that weren't quite uh, in focus before. So from those experiments, we can draw a few, a few lessons for trying to implement a time crystal in, on, on, on Sycamore, which is our, our goal here. So first of all, we need, of course, a big enough patch of space time. So we need a long enough coherence time that we can resolve this dynamical phase from uh, just, just short-lived transients. And this was true of all experiments and to which one sycamore. And then we need something that's genuinely many bodies. So it has you know, 
that, that, that such that you can distinguish what you see from few body uh, specific phenomena. And that's extremely true for the solids, which have millions of, of constituents. Um, it would be true of the 50 or so qubits on Sycamore. The trap time experiment had 10 qubits, which is sort of borderline between few and many body, but nonetheless displayed interesting results. Um, and uh, once you have that, you want to stabilize MBL. So that requires mainly having sufficiently short range interactions, which means genetically in these systems we have power law decaying potentials. The exponent of that decay needs to be sufficiently high. So it needs to be bigger than twice the dimensionality. And that wasn't true in either of the solids. Uh, for the trapped ions, it was about 1.5D, which is kind of borderline. It's a bit unclear uh, whether where exactly this, this boundary where MBL is possible sits, but um, it's, it's somewhere around there. And um, in addition, you need the disorder that you're trying to use to stabilize MBL to be even under the Ising symmetry. Uh, so for example, J times ZZ is fine. So you have disordered couplings in J, uh, you can use that to stabilize MBL. Uh, whereas if you have disorder in single, uh, single site fields, that turns out to uh, to leading order echo out under your your protocol. So you know, for some time you have a field pointing upwards, then you want to flip your spins. Your field is going to continue pointing upwards, and it's going to to leading order. It's going to cancel over two periods, and that's going to be uh, insufficient for stabilizing MBL. And then for detection, uh, you want to be able to do site result measurements so that you can really resolve this spatial temporal order rather than detecting some global magnetization, which could be conserved for different reasons. Uh, and you want to be able to probe a wide variety of initial states. And all of these properties, you know, Sycamore checks all these boxes, as would other kinds of digital quantum simulators of, of you know, with similar capabilities. Okay, so in the following, uh, in the last 10 minutes, I'm going to sharpen our proposal for uh, realizing this physics on the Sycamore device. Um, this is, you know, there are higher dimensional versions, but the simplest incarnation of this is 1D. Therefore, we wouldn't take full advantage of the 2D connectivity of Sycamore, but we would cut out some one dimensional path, such as this uh, snake here. And then we can implement something that's very, very close to the, uh, to the standard model of a time crystal that I flashed earlier uh, by using gates that are basically native to Sycamore. So the capabilities are all there. So, so the native gates there are um, parameterized by two numbers, this conditional phase angle, which is closely related to an Ising uh, JZZ interaction, which is what we need. And the swap angle, which we don't need, but you know we can we can sort of tolerate small fluctuations if 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 needed. And then the Ising kick is implemented by doing single qubit x rotations after you know one prequel layer of these uh, gates. So we have all the capabilities we need, um, and we can simulate it and see what we find. So here is the numerically obtained phase diagram for the model that I just described. And uh, again, I'm reminding you that we have, we're, we're fixing the conditional phase angle to be somewhere in this vicinity and to be strongly disordered in order to stabilize many body localization. Then we have a swap angle, which is the same in these two, uh, in these two, two uh, diagrams. And then we are varying the strength of the pulse, which is that the angle by which you are rotating your spin is twice G. So starting from a perfect pi pulse, you can see that we have an MBL time crystal over here and that it persists over a finite interval in the strength of the, of the kick. After some, you know, as you, as you decrease your pulse angle, eventually you enter a thermal phase. And then as you decrease it further and you uh, take it close to zero, you enter a many body localized phase, which doesn't have this time crystal in response that we call an MBL paramagnet. So the phases are there. Um, how would we see them in dynamics? Um, so we simulated this uh, temporal autocorrelator of spins uh, in either, you know, in representative points of these three phases. And as you can see, the MBL time crystal phase has this very striking period doubled response where um, this autocorrelator is close to plus one at even times and close to minus one at odd times and really all the way to infinity. So we simulate up to 10,000 cycles and it, it, it simply saturates onto some value and just stops decreasing. The same is true for the MBL paramagnet, except without the uh, period of doubled oscillation, uh, the response is synchronous and then it stays close to one for all times. Whereas in thermal phase, uh, this autocorrelator just decays very quickly within order one cycles and then just stays to zero. This is basically the uh, heat death scenario that I was uh, mentioning earlier. Everything becomes featureless. Uh, the same thing can be further highlighted by you know, taking advantage of these uh, very fine grained measurement capabilities on these devices. Uh, so here I'm showing you uh, snapshots in space time where you have 
the qubit number on the x-axis, so basically the position of your um, qubits. I'm simulating 20 qubits here. And uh, on the y-axis, the number of drive periods. So we're starting in all phases from the same uh, pseudo-random bit string with uh, some, some up spins and some down spins. And we are evolving them with the circuit that I described earlier. So in the, in the paramagnet, you can see that the memory of initial conditions is preserved, sorry, is preserved for arbitrarily long times. And here it may look as though you are sort of starting to melt. However, what you're seeing here, this loss is basically this dip over here, this initial transient. Um, and it would stop there and simply simply saturate for all the way up to infinitely long times. Uh, the time crystal phase has very similar behavior, except it also has, in addition to this uh, glassy ordering space, it has the period doubling in time, visible here. Whereas the thermal phase, as I was saying, becomes immediately featureless after one or two cycles. One more thing you can measure uh, by taking advantage of this very fine resolution is uh, the so-called Hamming distance, which is a measure of the distance between bit strings. So let's say you initialize a pseudo-random bit string in, in, your, in your initial state. So some sequence of up and down spins, which you can map onto zeros and ones. Um, you can then uh, sample bit strings uh, during the evolution as, you know, as was done in the, in the quantum computational supremacy experiment, sampling bit strings, bit string outputs of your circuit. Uh, and you can calculate their distance from your initial state and you can tabulate that distribution and show it evolving time. So I'm gonna show some animations. I hope that they show over Zoom, if not, uh, you know, I'll just describe them, I guess. But um, in the time crystal, you have this very striking uh, splitting where at even times your histogram remains peaked near zero. So your, your state sort of you know, evolves a little bit, but then saturates, you know, settles very close to the initial state. Whereas at odd times, you have the opposite. So the distance is always very close to maximal, which means that you're always very close to the completely flipped string. Uh, and on the MBL paramagnet side, you have the same thing, except there's no distinction between even and odd times. You constantly remain very close to the initial state. Good. So this is all very, very nice. However, uh, uh, Matteo, you also... have one. Uh, let me remind you, you have one minute remaining. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, this is all well, well and good. But uh, in the experiment, you would also have to contend with noise and decoherence, um, which would make this a little harder to observe. So we simulated that by using depolarizing channels, which uh, basically degrade your state with some rate. Uh, and you know, don't have time to get into details. But basically, uh, the result is that the effect of decoherence is local. So there is no harm in going to a bigger, to a longer chain. Uh, the lifetime of your time crystal signal um, wouldn't wouldn't uh, wouldn't shorten. So so there's no harm in, in making your chain as long as possible, which is a nice nice fact. Um, good. So with this, I conclude. Um, we have this immediate proposal for a, di a discrete time crystal phase on ISC devices, which we've detailed for the Sycamore device. Uh, this is a phase that has intrinsic interest. It hasn't quite been realized on other platforms, and it's a great fit for the capabilities of NISC devices. Uh, in the longer term, we're going to be investigating the MBL transition on Sycamore or similar devices. Uh, but also there are uh, there is a broader array of non-equilibrium phases that one could investigate. And also aside from phases, uh, even if you uh, consider thermalizing evolutions, there, there are very deep questions into how quantum chaos and thermalizations kick in uh, during unitary evolution. Furthermore, there has been lots of interest in dynamics of entanglement, particularly in the presence of uh, projective measurements, uh, which really couldn't be investigated on any other kind of device as, as, as critically as this. So, so that's an exciting frontier. So, so yeah, so this is all for the longer term. And in a very long term, you may ask, rather than having, you know, having questions to ask of these devices, you may hope that someday there will be a reversal where from these devices, just from exploring the possibilities, uh, they will stumble onto some, some new and exciting discoveries that, that will give theorists some, some new questions to think about that they didn't have beforehand. So yeah, these are my conclusions. I want to thank you and thank the organizers and my collaborators and uh, funding agencies. And I'll leave my conclusions up. All right. Thank you. So thank you very much, um, Matteo, for a very informative and um, interesting talk. So uh, we have time for three questions. Uh, Bill Phillips is asking, could you expand a bit on the idea that NISC is fundamentally about a higher temper high temperature? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's. Um, I want to emphasize that it's not a constraint, like you can enforce um, <clears throat> energy conservation and you can simulate ground states. So, so it's not that you can't, it's that somehow 
naturally, if you if you draw a random array of gates, uh, that that implements a driven system, and you end up with energy non-conserving processes and uh, and and high temperature uh, thermal states. So you could go in and, and constrain it so that you end up you know simulating low temperatures, and ultimately that's the goal, I guess. You want to have these technologies to a point where you can then go back to the old questions of condensed matter theory and address those. However, for the time being, it it's, it can be more more helpful to stick to so, sort of what's what's easiest for the device. Okay, so uh, next question: Floquet driven time crystal is reminiscent of classical chaotic systems with period doubling. Bill Phillips is asking, what distinguishes the, this from that? Right. So I mean, this is a in a quantum many body system. Um, so, um, right, there, there is, of course, an abundance of phenomena that involve period doubling across classical physics um, in dynamical systems that exhibit uh, yeah, period multiplexing of various kinds for different reasons. Uh, this is different because it involves many body quantum systems, and there, um, um, there is this, this sort of this curse of heating that's really, uh, that, makes, that makes this hard. Uh, that, like, if we didn't know about MBL, um, many body organization, then we would conclude that it's impossible because driven systems would thermalize. And so it's it's a non-trivial, you know, it's a non-trivial fact that this uh, is even possible. Uh, All right. So uh, Dan Stamper Kern is asking, quantum 2.0 is often described as uh, the unification of information theory with man by physics. What do you believe is a more in this unification? Is it the use of quantum information theory to understand physical systems, such as entanglement dynamics and materials, or the use of physics to treat a quantum computer as a new type of physical system? What approach is likely to yield discoveries? Uh, that's an excellent question. It's a very deep one. I think both are going to go hand in hand as we develop this understanding. <clears throat> um, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, there is a lot of excitement obviously around these uh, um, I don't know if you've heard the, the, the it from qubit collaboration, like the ideas that uh, information is somehow the most fundamental thing and that matter emerges from it. And so that it can really give you, so it's thinking of quantum information can really give you deep insights into what's um, what's going on in, in matter. Um, but obviously also the other way around where uh, just being able to have this access to these uh, simulation devices can just address uh, questions that, that you already have about about condensed matter. So, so yeah, I, I don't know that there is a way that I think is deeper, deeper uh, between the two, but I think that, that it's a very uh, profound connection that will have lots of implications in the future. All right, so uh, that's it for the questions for today. So let's thank both of the speakers once again for their excellent presentations. And so two uh, more things. Once is like, uh, we, if you have additional questions, you're welcome to join the speakers in post-seminar discussion. Link is gonna be put in the chat. And uh, I'd like to announce um, the next week, uh, next week talks. Uh, so that that are going to be due. To, um, see if you, you can see my screen. Next week's uh, famous talk is going to be due, uh, by David Weiss of Penn State, and um, we also have a quantum science seminar. Meet at uh, next. Thursday, October 29th at 17.00 CET. So uh, with that, so um, I'm looking forward to additional discussions and thank you all for attending this famous talk. Thank you.